Uh, thanks a lot, Davide, for the uh, invitation. So this talk actually is a continuation of uh, Piotr's talk, if you were in the previous uh, session. So we have this fantastic uh, chip now that offers us um, um, possibility to put um, computation in the pixel. And now the question is, what do we do with those? So um, we can implement a bunch of algorithms that we've seen before. And here I'll try to um, show how we can see those as much bigger opportunities than just um, using them for simple um, low-level early vision algorithms. So let me um, just uh, step back a little. So we're interested in vision, and vision is the complex interaction of light and matter through physics. And we are lucky enough to have optics and this optical encoding that, we, that, has, been, that has captured um, some of the physics property is then coming to some sensor. I'll talk a lot about those, producing what I will call a visual code. And then we have our vision algorithms taking these visual codes and outputting what I will call visual quantities of interest from light, which are the visual quantities of interest that any of us is interested to actually endow our systems with some kind of intelligence. And so from a high level pr perspective, we're interested in quantities such as properties of the scene, like motion of objects, their spatial extent, or properties of the observer properties of light sources, and in fact, many others. So I like to think of this whole vision chain as some encoding of light matter interactions into some visual code, and then we have these vision algorithms that actually act as a decoder. So now the interesting thing is if we go into slightly more jargon and we compile down these quantities in a bunch of uh, uh, known words to this community, we get, say, apparent motion of objects in the focal plane, that's called optic flow, or light intensity, or depth. So these are as many visual quantities that all of us might know. And for each of these visual quantity, one can think of creating a sensor. And in fact, we have a few examples of those sensors. So if I think of light intensity, for instance, we have APS cameras. An APS camera reports frames in which each pixel reports photon flux as integrated during a certain amount of time and report images. Now, this workshop is about weird sensors. We have learned a lot about event-based sensors. And an event-based sensor, you can actually think of it as reporting some correlates of the temporal derivative of photometry. And now you get it in a slightly different form of a stream, a continuous stream of blue and red dots that correspond to this one-bit quantized sign of the temporal derivative, and that correlates with this um, temporal derivative of light intensity. But you can think of more exotic sensors, say, like an optical mouse. An optical mouse actually is nothing else than something cleverly engineered on a small 16 by 16 pixel array to compute optic flow and translate that in a global motion that is the cursor you move on your screen. But we can sense other properties of light waves, say it's direction of vibration, that would be the polarization. And there are people actually working on polarization sensor with a lot of interest for very accurate depth reconstruction. So that would be, for instance, uh, the work of Victor Greff at uh, UIUC. Um, so we're in these positions where we have all kind of visual sensitivity that we can sense. Now, say you want to know something about parallax in the scene because ba parallax is pretty interesting. It relates very nicely to depth. Well, you might not have a parallax sensor. However, between all these quantities, we have geometry, assumptions we make about the world, assumptions we make about the physics, and we know of how each of these quantities relate to each other. So each of the edge now, in this graph I'm going to draw, correspond to some relation that exists between visual quantities of interest. And now that's the game we are playing. We have some sensor, we have some relation between these visual quantities. So for instance, the way you would derive parallax depth, linear velocity or pressure properties, um, um, relation is obviously if you have some objects at some depth and you move at a particular speed, you give me the projection properties of the cameras and I can tell you in the image how these things would move. And things closer would obviously induce some faster apparent motion than things that are further away. What is interesting is it works in all directions. You can infer depth based on parallax, linear velocity, and projective properties. You can infer linear velocity based on parallax, depth, and projective properties and all permutations. So in this situation where we have quantities, we have relations which are algorithms or costs that relay this quantity from one another. And ultimately, if we wanted the ultimate vision system, I think we would be interested in deriving all these visual quantities all kind of jointly. So this view suggests a few interesting points that are going to drive this talk. So first is that if you see, for instance, this whole graph and you're really interested in depth and you don't have a depth sensor, maybe it doesn't really make sense to sense light intensity because light intensity is a few hops away if you have to go from this place to this place, you're a few hops away. And this is how, how much inference will actually, you will have to pay for inferring depth from light intensity. Reciprocally, 
if you have, say, reflectance, right, it might not even be possible to infer reflectance for something which is up there in this network. So first thing, let's sense different visual quantities that light intensity. We have examples of those. These are event sensors, for instance. Uh, because uh, sensing these indirect correlates of light density or direct correlates of a visual quantity you're more interested in might be in your advantage. A way to do this is by building sensors or by performing inference. But let's say we want to build sensors, and a way to do this is we're going to be by bringing more intelligence closer to the sensor on the focal plane by, for instance, adapting our sampling strategy. That's what the DVS is doing. And now that we have brought this intelligence in the pixel of the sensor, we might want to think of designing the vision systems completely differently because we might not even have access to an image anymore. We might just have access to something which is forming in an image, like Piotr uh, talked about in our HDR that I'll come um, uh, to in a minute. So we might have to actually co-design the algorithm, the hardware, and all these decoders together. So bringing more intelligence in the pixel. So let me define intelligence by the number of transistors. This is where we were, in, a, in fact, a few years ago. Four transistors in a pixel, and with four transistors, three or four transistors, you're basically bound to integrate photon flux and report something that correlates to this uh, amount of charge integ integrated. Now, if you give me more transistors, about 17 to 25, 30 transistors, you can start making a log, log photosensor front end, having some amplification, um, a differentiation stage, and a comparator. You get something like a DVS pixel. Now give me even more, and let's be wild, and you get what Piotr has done. Uh, about 150 transistors, I guess, maybe, maybe a bit more. You have a pixel which is generally programmable. You can do whatever you want in your pixel, but what do we want in this pixel? That's the question I'm going to ask. So, Indeed, there's a wide variety of things that you, go, that you can create here. And there are other sensors than these three sensors that exist. If you think of what LIDARs or multi-bucket sensors, for instance, for structured light, all these kind of things, are, they lie all within this range. And they're more specific than general purpose near focal plane sensor. And they give you access to different visual quantities that actually uh, you know, might require more intelligence. So using pixel intelligence, the first thing that comes to my mind is we could start to control integration. So what does it mean, controlling integration? Well, if you tell me now sensing and processing are together, we should be able, for instance, to say whenever we want a pixel to stop integrating. And nothing tells me that the best way to stop integrating is to actually start integrating all my pixels simultaneously, stop integrating all my pixels simultaneously, and reading out, which is here representing by the blue line, all synchronously. If you do, do, if you do that, it's a valid way to sense you get a conventional image, which also means that in places where the radiance is very high, the pixels that have actually integrated here might have saturated. So you get no, you get saturation, you get overexposure. So the first thing you might want to do with this intelligence is to say certain pixels might want to stop integrating earlier. And as a natural side effect, you get HDR. So here in 2016 with Piotr and my colleagues, we designed a smart integration criterion that prescribed for each pixel whenever the pixel should stop integrating. Now, nothing says that the pixel could not start integrating at different moments either. So now you're in this situation. So in this situation, you get something which is relatively well known, which is actually called coded exposure imaging. So it has been done by um, uh, teams like um, Shrin Ayar in 2011, but now what we can do is that we don't need an external device, so they're using a DMD, the same thing you have in your video projectors, to switch on and off the pixel state and to emulate different integration. Now we can do it directly in the pixel. So what do you get? Well, you get natural high speed. So there's a funny thing here, because you get different overlaps of pixel integrations, so you get these kind of very funny frames where uh, some pixels have actually integrated later and some pixels have integrated earlier. And using the same kind of optimization you get in compress sensing, you can decompress this frame. And now we come to this decoder I was talking about. So we use some vision algorithms to transform this frame into the information you really captured. And now as a corollary, you get some high speed um, sensing. And if you go extreme, you don't get synchronous readout. You don't get a um, synchronous reset. And you don't get a synchronous start of exposure you get something like dynamic vision sensing, which actually reports some information whenever some, something happens. Here it turns out to be some threshold crossing, like sigma delta modulation, but it could be something else. So is that the only thing we can do by placing some intelligence in pixel? Well, actually, we demonstrated we can do a bunch of different things. So here I'm just showing a bunch of our work we did. We use that for um, 
uh, depth from focus. We use that for tracking using the similar kind of equation that Yula presented in the previous talks. And to answer Robert, we actually also used it to solve Poisson equation directly uh, on the focal plane, and we can get a gradient image that also solves its own little image reconstruction, which makes no sense, but it's just to show it's possible. So it's indeed possible to do this with this kind of uh, processor, local processing. And I have five minutes remaining. Good. So, <laughs> so we, ha we are in this situation. We have sensors, vision algorithm, and our sensors we see could actually provide different visual codes, events, images, coded images, and we showed that the nice product of having intelligence in the pixel is that we alleviate the sensor processor bottleneck. You could, uh, you could call it channel capacity limitation. There's that much information you can transfer from your sensor and your processor, and if you try to do more, it's just not possible. Either you don't have capacity to process on the end or capacity to sense on the, on the front end. So what you would probably want to do, in fact, is to optimize what's the visual code that you should get to have a particular quantity of interest. So I jump on what Piotr said earlier. It's not clear that events are actually what we want to do if we want to do, for instance, SLAM or feature tracking or who knows what. In fact, what I would really want to do is to take this top-down approach to define our task, define the metric we are interested in, and co-optimizing the vision algorithm, meaning the decoder, with the encoding, meaning what is the right sampling strategy. I showed different sampling strategy, but there might be other and better sampling strategies. And so interesting. Interestingly, um, some people have done that. They have not put the sensor in the loop, but they have optimized optics and vision algorithms. Actually, we have two people in this room that actually have done the work that I'm, that I'm going to present here. So I'm going to zoom through it because they know much more than I about it, but it's, it's going to be the same principle. What we would want to do, or what these people did, is that, for instance, they co-optimized what the lens should be for a particular um, uh, functionality. Here the functionality was, let's say we want to do super resolution. So they had some uh, Wiener deconvolution here, and here they were optimizing the phase mask of a diffractive optical element. And what it turned out the lens learned to do is to, instead of giving you a single point as a response from a point source of light, which we call the point spread function, to divide the energy in three so that you somehow maximally cover your pixel grid, and then your reconstruction would learn to basically reassemble these things optimally to give you super resolution. So I'm not gonna go into details, but that's a very interesting paper you can read, and actually it started a big stream of work in which people are co-optimizing uh, optics and uh, vision algorithms together. And people in our group recently did uh, the same for depth, monocular depth imaging. So now it turns out that you can encode some of the depth information uh, in your um, point spread function again. And that's interesting because actually all in focus image, for instance, remove some of the cues we use as humans that are pretty useful. Namely, one of the useful cues to infer depth is defocus. So depending on where you are here, you can say basically you're further, of, uh, of, um, further away from the focal plane. Right? So now, interestingly, there are full symmetries here, and you might use chromatic aberration and even rotation of the PSF to encode depth information. And it turns out that if you do so, you end up being not quite as good as if you were using a LiDAR, so this is on some key T data set, but you're in fact actually orders of magnitude, well, you're actually much better than just conventional methods that would try to do monocular depth imaging directly on RGB images. So this was done on uh, images taken via this system that actually was using this lens. Okay, so all in all to say, what I think we want to do in the future is the following. We want to take our optics, take our vision algorithm, not only co-optimize vision algorithm opt optics, but also co-optimize the sensing strategy. And the few works I've shown in the beginning, I think, go in that direction, but we should go even, even further than that. So that's the wrap-up. We, we are interested in extracting these visual quantities of interest from light matter interaction. And this is done by sensing part of the physics from which we directly derive some visual quantities. Now, depending on what we sense, Obviously, inference of some visual quantities might be easier or more difficult, if not impossible. So one way, actually, to do some interesting uh, sensing is to sense differently by bringing some processing close to the sensor. So not only this mitigates the sensing processing bottleneck, but this actually can help you by cleverly designing some visual codes, which is this name I give to 
what you produce here after your sensor so that it can be optimally decoded by some vision algorithm. And now the, legitimately que the legitimate question I think we should ask is what is the right visual code? And this we should find by optimization, co-optimization of the lens, of the sensor, and of the vision algorithms. And there were many people with who I developed these ideas, so um, thanks to them.